Se você está vendo este que já é o If you're watching this, which is already the third chapter of the Apocryphal Gospels series, then you'll already be quite familiar with the two narratives seen in the previous chapters, the first being about the birth and youth of Mary according to the Apocryphal Gospel of James, and the second about the childhood of Jesus according to the Apocryphal Gospel of Thomas the Israelite. Segundo o Evangelho Apócrifo de Tomé, o Israelita. Se não viu os dois primeiros... If you haven't seen the first two chapters, I recommend watching them before this one because this episode continues the continuity from the previous chapters, just as the whole series is structured. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the so-called Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, which also tells the story of the birth and youth of Mary, the mother of Jesus. This Gospel is an adaptation originally written in Latin from the Greek Gospel of James, which was the subject of the first chapter of the series. Its composition is estimated to be in the 7th century, and it has hundreds of known manuscripts copied between the 9th and 16th centuries. Being a later text from the Middle Ages, it already brings more details and possible early indications of traditions from the early Christian churches, especially those related to the Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, Saint Joaquim, and Saint Anne. The word apocryphal comes from the Greek apocryphos, which means hidden. In literature, the term is commonly used to designate those books that were kept clandestine, and in bibliology, it is used to identify the religious works of the early church that lack canonical authority, meaning they were not read in public worship because they are not considered the word of God given to men. It's worth noting that the term apocryphal should not be considered pejorative, as its content may contain historical truths. The apocryphal gospels are texts written at different times, many of them belonging to the early church and others already medieval. This series will only present comments, curiosities, and references about these texts, a guide to introduce the themes and to arouse interest in delving deeper into the knowledge of the history of salvation. The full text can be found on the internet for free, and for this series, the translation by Professor Federico Lorenzo from the University of Coimbra, published in 2022, was used. The Apocryphal Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew Aqui, Joaquim, pai de Maria. Here Joaquim, the father of Mary, is a rich and prosperous shepherd. He marries and at the age of 20, and in the 20 years of marriage, they have no children together, which causes him deep sadness. The narrative is quite similar to that of the parents of Isaac, Samson, Samuel, and even the narrative of Luke about Zechariah and Elizabeth, as detailed in the first chapter of the series. 
Just like Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, this Anne, the grandmother of Jesus, promises to God that if he gives her a son, he will be offered to serve God in the temple. The answer comes with an angel, who promises her not only that her womb will be fruitful, but also that the being born of her will be admired in all centuries until the end. The angel also communicates with Joachim, who is with his sheep on the mountain in deep depression, and he tells him something quite interesting in this context. When Joachim asks for a blessing for himself, his slave, the angel rebukes him saying, Do not call yourself a slave, but a slave together with me, for we are slaves of one master. This gospel, even being apocryphal, brings in these small details the essence of the Christian message in all its peculiarity and delicacy. A revolution, which is always violent, is not called for a change of regime, but rather, spiritual reflection is invited, which will have a direct impact on physical life, we are all equal before God, regardless of the position in which society places us. Mary's conception is described very beautifully by the angel to Joachim later, in a dream. I am the angel that has been given to you by God as a guardian. Go down safely and return to Anne, because the acts of mercy that you, and your wife, and, practiced before the Most High have been recounted. And such a seed is given to you, similar to which neither prophets nor saints have had nor will have from the beginning. Here, Mary is placed in her place of honor within the Christian religion clearly and directly, leaving no room for interpretations, and takes Mary to the temple in the third year, when she ceased to breastfeed. Mary climbs the 15 steps of the temple very quickly, showing no fear of leaving her parents, as expected in childhood. The text suggests that she feels, in the temple, the same connection with the father that Jesus felt at the age of 12, according to Luke's narrative. Mary, at the age of three, is described as very mature for her age, with perfect diction and dedication to praises, as if she were already 30 years old. From the ninth hour onwards, Mary devoted herself every day to praying until an angel appeared to her, from whose hand she received food. She was constant, immovable, unchanging, and progressed daily, becoming better and better. This gospel indicates that the young Mary was the first to use the greeting, thanks be to God, and from then on, people began to use the phrase in the same way, as is typical in predominantly Christian countries to this day. If any sick person touched her, he would return home healed immediately, says the Gospel, and it is interesting because it reminds us of this Catholic custom of touching Mary's representation asking for miracles. In chapter 7, Mary herself refuses a marriage proposal from the father of a young man, justifying her decision with a well-founded argument about the virtues of maintaining virginity. Perhaps here lies one of the roots of the incorporation of the purity-slash-virginity relationship that Christianity absorbed from the cultures and religions of these peoples. In chapter 8, Mary's so-called entry into womanhood is indicated, that is, her first menstruation, at the age of 14. For this reason, she could no longer live in the temple, as is also described in the apocryphal Gospel of James. Drawing lots, Joseph is chosen as the guardian of Mary's virginity, exactly as in the apocryphal Gospel of James. Here, Joseph is also described as already being an elderly man with children, and therefore, he does not want to marry Mary because of the girl-slash-infant married to him, already old, would be a subject of ridicule in the community. Joseph indicates a desire to raise her until she can be given as a wife to one of his sons, but the priest makes it clear that when the time comes, Joseph himself should take her as his wife. 
Five other virgins from the temple will live in Joseph's house so that Mary has company. They are Rebecca, Zipporah, Susanna, Abigail, and Zillah. The angel announces Jesus' birth on the second day and concludes the Annunciation on the third. On the second day, the announcer is described as a young man whose beauty cannot be described. This happens while Joseph was working as a carpenter in Capernaum, where he continues to live for nine months. The priests, upon discovering that Mary was pregnant, arrest Joseph on the accusation that he violated the agreement to respect her virginity. Joseph argues that he did not violate the agreement, and Mary confirms it. At this moment, the priests propose a test to prove if Joseph is telling the truth. He must drink the water of the Lord's drink, something reminiscent of Catholic holy water, and walk seven times around the altar. If the person is lying, the Lord would give some sign on his countenance, which did not happen with Joseph and neither with Mary, because they were both telling the truth. It's remarkable the sheer number of rituals that strongly recall ancient popular beliefs that are scarcely present in the canonical Gospels and the Hebrew Bible itself. All this happened with numerous witnesses and guided by the priests, as described. In this Gospel, in chapter 13, we have the same account as Luke's, where Caesar Augustus census forces Joseph and Mary to register in Bethlehem. Here, an interesting fact is also highlighted, at that time, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Then, in the same chapter, we have a fantastic quest to already clarify, even before the birth of Christ, the universality of the divine message. Mary, on the way, comments to Joseph that she is having a vision of two peoples, one weeping and one rejoicing. Upon being rebuked by Joseph, a being described as a beautiful young man appears to her, saying, Mary saw the Jewish people weeping because they had departed from their God, and the people of the Gentiles rejoicing because they had approached and become close to God. The time is coming when, in the seed of Abraham, the blessing is granted to all peoples. In the canonical Gospel of Matthew, for example, in chapter 15 verses 21 to 28, a Canaanite woman has to argue with Jesus defending the same thesis, which until that moment did not seem clear. The same account is in the canonical Gospel of Mark, chapter 7 verse 24. Here, just as in the apocryphal Gospel of James, Jesus is born in a cave on the way to Bethlehem. The chapter describes details such as the cave being so deep that it had never received sunlight but, with Mary's entry, it became illuminated as if it were noon throughout the time the Holy Family stayed there, even at night. It also describes angels surrounding the newborn Jesus. In the same cave, with a narrative very similar to that of the Apocryphal of James, Joseph arrives with two midwives, this time named, in addition to Salome, Salome. Salome verifies the virginal birth, without pain, and observes that Mary also breastfeeds the baby, proving the miraculous birth. Then, the incredulous Salome repeats the test, and the similarity with James returns, her hand deforms, and, upon touching and worshipping the child, she is healed. At the end of chapter 13, the appearance of a star of unparalleled brightness over the cave is described. It was visible from Jerusalem, and the prophets who were there said it indicated the birth of Christ. In chapter 14, Mary leaves the cave three days after the birth of Christ. Then, she enters a stable and places Jesus in a manger, where the child is adored by an ox and a donkey. The author says that these events fulfill prophecies of Isaiah and Habakkuk. Joseph and Mary remain there for another three days. It is inevitable to compare the repetition of the three-day period with the death and resurrection of Christ. It should also be noted how the author seeks to imitate Matthew's literary style, relating events to Old Testament prophecies. In chapter 15, having passed six days since the birth of Christ, Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem, where they spend the seventh day. 
On the 8th, Jesus is taken to the temple to fulfill the Jewish rite of circumcision and presentation to the temple, where the boy is recognized as the Messiah by Simeon and Anna, in a similar account to Luke 2 verses 25 to 38. After the second year, the Magi arrive in Jerusalem, in a narrative similar to Luke's Gospel. This Gospel also does not mention how many Magi there were, nor does it call them kings. In addition to the gifts given by each of them, gold, incense, and myrrh, each of them also leaves a gold coin for the baby Jesus. The account similar to Luke's continues, and Herod orders the death of all children up to two years old, and here we know why. Since Jesus had already reached two years, and here the deaths are ordered without distinction between male and female. Joseph is warned in a dream that he must flee to Egypt, and he leaves immediately, and here we return to the narrative not present in Luke. Joseph and Mary take with them three male slaves and one female slave, which may sound strange because it is not common to imagine Mary and Joseph as wealthy people, much less as slave owners. But it is worth remembering that the context of slavery there was not similar to what happened in the Americas, for example, but this is already a topic that should be further explored and whose summary does not fit here, as it could generate much confusion with historical contexts. The most fantastic thing happens later. Joseph stops to rest in a cave and, there, there were animals described in the text as a dragons. The slaves went out screaming in fear, but the little Jesus comes down from his mother's lap and stands before the beasts, which submit to the child. The most curious thing is that, just like in the canonical Gospels, the author justifies this narrative as fulfilling a prophecy of King David, citing the book of Psalms 148 verse 7. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, and all deeps. It is true that we have a very clear mythological image of the dragon in our minds, but the original Hebrew of this psalm can help us. According to Albert Barnes, Ye dragons, on the meaning of this word, see Psalms 91 verse 13, note, Isaiah 13 verse 22, note. The word may mean a great fish, a whale, a sea monster, or a serpent. It would seem to refer here to whales and sea monsters. See the notes at Revelation 12 verse 3. And all deeps, all that are in the depths of the sea, not merely the dragons or sea monsters, but all that inhabit the oceans. Joseph Benson's commentary adds, From heaven above the psalmist descends to the deep beneath, which, while it proclaims the power, observes the laws and decrees of him who made it, and poured it abroad. And the same may be said of its enormous inhabitants, which are under the command of Jehovah, and of none but him. By dragons here, we may either understand serpents, which abide in the deep caverns or holes of the earth, or, rather, whales, crocodiles, and other sea monsters, which dwell in the depths of the sea, or of rivers, and are often intended by the word, here rendered dragons. I know it might seem like we're going around in circles trying to justify something that, at first glance, clearly sounds mythical, theological, or even a suggestive allegory. And I agree, it does seem like mythology to me, but only at first glance. I prefer to try to understand why this term is used, after all, it's a translation into English of a text written in Latin in the Middle Ages, quoting a psalm written centuries before Christ. Reflecting on and delving a little deeper is the least respect we can have for such an ancient writing. Voltando à narrativa, 
Returning to the narrative, the author also states that the wild beasts began to escort the family during the journey, without even attacking the oxen and sheep they were leading, citing the fulfillment of the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah 65 verse 25, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. In addition to this fantastic account, the description of the journey of the Holy Family is quite different from the art we have available, because what we have here is not just the three members and the donkey, but rather some slaves and several domestic animals. On the third day of the journey, Mary stops to rest in the shade of a palm tree and tells Joseph that she wishes to eat some fruits, but they are all high up in the tree. Joseph replies that he is more concerned about water, which is running out. Jesus sits on his mother's lap and orders the palm tree to bend, and his family feeds on its fruits. Then the boy orders it to return to its original position and for its roots to bring forth the waters beneath the earth for his family, and immediately clean and sweet water springs forth from its roots. The next day, Jesus consecrates the palm tree, and an angel takes one of its leaves to heaven. Joseph and Mary watch everything in great fear, but Jesus says that the palm tree will serve the saints in heaven, in place of delights, just as it served them in the desert. On the way, Joseph prays to God for permission to travel by the sea route, stopping at coastal villages, and Jesus, already expressing the voice of God, tells him that on the same day, Joseph would complete the journey that would normally take 30 days. The family then begins to see the Egyptian hills and cities, and they arrive in the area of Hermopolis, entering a city called Sotina. Having no friends or relatives in the place, they enter a pagan temple called the capital of Egypt. When Mary entered the temple, all the pagan statues fell to the ground, with their faces broken, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 19 verse 1. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. It's really interesting to see the care the author takes in repeating the style of the canonical Gospel of Matthew, justifying all the accounts as fulfillment of Jewish prophecies. When Aphrodisius, the governor of the city, is informed, he immediately goes with his army to the temple. Upon arrival, contrary to the expectation that the family would be punished for what happened, Aphrodisius declares that the Egyptian people must also recognize and bow down to God through Jesus Christ. This documentary has no intention of stirring up controversy on the topic, mainly because there is no reason to do so. For a long time, the apocryphal texts sparked more discussions about whether they should be read or not, rather than actual reading and reflection on these books. They are part of the history of the Church and Christianity, just like the other books of the Christian Bible, and in them, we find the roots of many Christian traditions around the world. It's also worth noting that the Christian Bible differs among the various Christian denominations, as there are differences between the Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant Bibles in the number of books contained in each canon. To understand and reflect on the apocryphal texts, one must engage in the same exercise as studying the Bible and any other historical writing, understanding the time, place, culture, language, in short, the historical context. Things that were common 100 years ago might be unacceptable today, so it's reasonable to assume that when discussing things written 2,000 years ago, the shock would be even stronger, which is not exclusive to the Bible or religion, but rather a characteristic of history. Therefore, in the case of this series, which will only cover the apocryphal Gospels, we have the opportunity to consult other sources about the people who lived with Christ and about Christ himself, as here there is a fact that does not differ from the canonical Gospels. Everything written about Christ was written by people who were around him and by the communities founded by these and other people. Jesus himself left nothing in writing. And I say only the apocryphal gospels because there are also apocryphal books of the Old Testament and epistles.
curiosity about the facts of Christ's life and the origins of Christianity and its traditions is present in the most diverse groups of our society, we are Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, Pentecostals, Jews, Muslims, Atheists, Agnostics, Historians, and also curious lay people, who may belong to any of the aforementioned groups. The series was made with the intention of satisfying some of the endless interest in what is undoubtedly the greatest historical figure of humanity, Jesus Christ.